Hi, and welcome to Gets a Palooza. I thought what I'd do today is talk a little bit about what we've done here in Madison to grow our Bushido group. Over the last few months, it's grown quite a bit from about uh, anywhere from two to four active players to 11 or 12, and we just sent off a couple of college students, but we just picked up another couple of players over the last week. So we're doing pretty well. I thought I would share some of the things that we've done in hopes that maybe some of you will be able to apply um, some of our methods of success towards your own situations and we can grow the group in the United States especially. Uh, those of you overseas might find some of what we do interesting or useful, um, but you don't have some of the same problems that we do because you have stores that carry Bushido and you know all the actions over there at the moment. So this is uh, targeted especially towards uh, those of us in the U.S. who are trying to build our groups without easy access to Bushido and uh, the GCT line. So anyway, uh, what I've done is I've come up with um, an outline. So if you see my eyes go down, that's because I've got the outline in front of me. And um, maybe I can uh, at least give you guys some idea of what's worked well here. And hopefully you can apply it to your own situations. So let's start. Uh, I've set it into basically categorize things into three groups. Playing publicly, playing beautifully, and playing generously. And I'll talk about each of these in turn. First, let's start with play publicly. Of course, the only way you can really attract people to Bushido is if they see you playing. So they can see you having fun with the game, they can see the, the beauty of the game, and uh, see it on a nice table with these beautiful models that GCT produces. So you've got to make sure that when you're playing Bushido, you're in a public space. So if you're currently playing at somebody's house, I know that's great and it's intimate and it's kind of fun because you can stay up and listen to music and do whatever you want, but it's not going to do you any good when it comes to actually growing the size of your group. So the first thing you need to do is find a store that will support you in playing Bushido. Especially in the U.S., most of the independent gaming stores aren't going to have a link with GCT and they're not going to be able to carry the products. So finding a store that will support you can be a little tricky. We are lucky in Madison in that in this region we have two stores that support us very nicely. We've got Misty Mountain Games, which is in Madison, Wisconsin, and about 40 miles north, we have the Labyrinth Games in Baraboo. And both these store owners are really nice guys. They think the game is cool and they just are used to supporting their gamers, even if it's in a system that they're not making any money off of, at least not directly. Of course, the stores will make money indirectly by sales of paint and things like that. But in relative terms, they're really not making any money on, on our game. Once you have a store, you want to set up a time for your group to meet on a regular schedule. Uh, initially, we started playing here ad hoc. You know, we'd, we'd get together or we'd get on the internet and figure out when people were available. And we'd just play whenever, you know, people could get together. But we decided as a group that it would be better if we actually had a regular time for us to gather, not only to make it easier for us all to schedule our days, but that means that anybody that's interested in the game, if they happen to see us, will know that we are at the store at a regular day at a regular time. So if they're curious about it, they can follow up. Um, it greatly increases the chances that people who see the game are going to be able to pursue it and talk to you about it if they decide it's something they might be interested in. The other thing that we did is um, we have our game night uh, in Madison is on a Wednesday, and that is the same time the 40K players play. Now, most of us who are currently playing Bushido are either 40K players or War Machine players. And on Friday nights, we play in Baraboo the same time that the War Machine players play. And that has worked out pretty well. It's 
exposed Bushido to other war gamers who we already know who are friends of ours. And it has definitely attracted some people to the game. Uh, the more people that can see you playing and can see the game, the better your chances are of finding those few people who actually want to make a transition or just want to pick it up as an extra game that they do sometimes. We still, you know, those of us who are playing Bushido, it's not that we've sworn off of the other games that we've played, but Bushido's fresh and it's interesting and it's very quick and very cheap and all those things make it very attractive. It's also very tactical, so it's a it's a good tactical game to play and you know that can be a nice change you know from from whatever you are usually been doing I've been playing 40k for 25 years and I did not have any intention of picking up another game but uh, I did a demo of Bushido and fell in love with it for a number of reasons and and a lot of people who have come over from other gaming systems have had some of the same experiences I have the other thing, once you have a place to play and a time to play, when you're setting up at the game store, you want to make sure that you put your Bushido table in a very prominent place where people are going to see it. Uh, I don't know about your particular situation, but most of the game stores around here have got the sales stuff in the cash register up front, and then the back of the store is usually where there are gaming tables lined up usually with a central aisle going back and forth. The bathrooms tend to be in the back. and So we make sure that we put at least one of our tables right on the aisle, right at the end of the table on the aisle, so that everybody walking up and down that main aisleway can see us playing the game. That has been very important for attracting attention. People will walk by and stop and look because it is such a visually arresting game and it's unlike anything they've seen before. They stop and they ask questions and they ooh and they ah over it, and that's exactly what we're looking for. So that's actually what casinos do. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is playing beautifully. What I mean by playing beautifully is one of the main attractions for many of us to Bushido is the visual impact that the game has. The feudal Japan is a marvelous background to have a war game in, and the fact that it is mixed uh, with reality and fantasy and mythology makes for a, a really tremendous setting. And all of the things you can do to create a, a beautiful board so that the set piece that your game takes place on is very attractive and very alluring. Can, really pull people in. It, it astounds me when we're playing how many people just walk by and they walk up to the table and they start asking questions and their eyes are big as saucers and their mouths are kind of hanging open and they say, wow, what is this game? You know, I've never seen this before. And and that's that's what you want. You know, you want those kind of contacts. So that starts by having nicely painted figures. Now, I'm not expecting everybody to be a virtuoso, but you have a nicely painted figures. We've got beautiful sculpts. Um, GCT, their, their sculptors do a tremendous job coming up with, with really interesting and fun sculpts that really give a lot of opportunities for painting. Um, just paint them as well as you can. Uh, nice, neat, clean. Um, when I've talked to people, younger painters, about painting, neatness counts, uh, not just in your schoolwork, but it does in painting as well. Um, and base your figures nicely. Basing is huge. It can turn an okay figure into a nice, really nice figure, and it can turn a nicely painted figure into a fantastic figure. You can use the colors of the base to either reflect or contrast with the colors in the model, or you can make the basing match whatever your board happens to be. It's all up to you. But if the figures are nicely painted and based, that's where it starts. The second part is making a really neat board. Now, there are some mats available. Um, I happen to like real boards more than I like mats. Uh, they just have a... I think, I think they connect with the figures and the models, the terrain and the buildings and stuff. I think there's a, 
a better connection there because even a flat board, if it's got some gravel on it and some grass, is by its nature three-dimensional, and a mat is by its very nature two-dimensional. And the three-dimensional board will, will be much more cohesive and consistent with the three-dimensional terrain and three-dimensional models that we put on it. Building boards is very um, off-putting at the beginning. I dragged my feet on it for quite a while until I finally forced myself to do it and discovered how stupid simple it was. I, I was so mad at myself afterwards because I delayed for so long. Uh, what I'm going to do here is we're going to do a cutaway and I'll take you over and we'll take a look at, at a couple of my boards that I've made out of plywood and I'll talk a little bit about how they were made. Um, it is really simple. Uh, a basic board you could throw together in an afternoon, uh, a little bit of drying time involved, and you'll be good to go. Here we are with the first board I made. I thought this would be a good one to, to take a look at. Now, as you can see, it's not really complicated, but it makes a beautiful backdrop for playing. Uh, you guys have seen it multiple times. And I'm pretty proud of the way it looks. However, it's not complicated. All it is, is a two by two piece of quarter inch plywood, half inch plywood, that I painted brown. Just went to the hardware store, picked up a small jar of brown paint. Painted the whole thing brown, including the edges, just to make it look a little bit more finished. Uh, when it was dry, I took a dilute mix of glue, probably, oh, more or less 50-50. I honestly don't think I even bothered to pre-mix it. I think I just took white glue and spread it all over the board and then um, took some wet brush and just kind of spread it out so it covered the whole board. And then I took some grit. This is just a Different size grits. I took some sand. You can see the lighter stuff there is sand. The darker brown stuff is a couple of different sizes of Gale Force 9 grit. Doesn't really matter what you put on here. Uh, I didn't want to have to paint the grit though, so which is why I like the Gale Force 9 in the sand because it has natural colors. And I just scattered it around. I put it in piles in certain areas and not piles in others, just kind of scattered around lightly. And then I took <clears throat> cover a couple different colors of static grass and basically just held my hand above it and you know I'd take a bunch of static grass held my hand above it and just sprinkled it around again some areas a little denser some not so dense some areas the the board is practically bare and in other places it's completely covered either by grit or by grass but this modeled kind of board really lends itself to being useful in just about any circumstance um, it might have been nice if I put a, a road or something through it. I may do it with the next board I do. Um, you just remember the more specific detail you put into your board, the more limited you are as far as how you can set things up on it that make sense, that look like they belong. So if I put a road there, I can't then put a house in the middle of the road. I mean, I could, but, you know, it, it wouldn't look as nice if I did that, so... Anyway, it's all there is to it. I mean, the, the you take the board. The board was scrap. So I went to the local hardware store. They had a, a section where they had scrap pieces of plywood, and there was two-by-two two sections already in there, so I bought two of them and didn't cost me much money. And so we just paint the whole thing the base color and then spread white glue and thin it out with a wet, big, wet brush and then just dump stuff on top of it and let it dry. And then at the very end, if you want to, railroad stores have, let's see, do I have it anywhere? Well, I don't have the spray bottle, but I can show you this much. So this, if you, sorry for showing you my messy studio. So this is just, again, dilute, you can hear it, it's just dilute white glue. And somewhere here I have a, a spray bottle attachment that goes on this. And so once I had all the all the stuff on and it was dry, I, I just sprayed this dilute glue on with the, you know, like a bottle of Fantastic or whatever. You just spray it on to soak it. 
and then you let that dry and that's again it's a model railroading technique for getting ground cover to stay put and then once that that was dry was done so by far the the waiting for things to dry um was the thing that took up the most time the actual construction of the board maybe took a half hour maybe so there you go nice board um i'll put some decorations on it and uh, we'll talk about those in a minute so it starts with a nice board once you get your board made then it's just a matter of <clears throat> getting some nice terrain um, there are some fantastic buildings that are built for Bushido and for other games like Kensai. Most of the buildings you'll find are 28 millimeter, not 32. Makes them a little small to play inside of. However, I think the general consensus is people like the 28 millimeter buildings better because they're a little smaller, which means you can either get more buildings or you can get a, a cooler, bigger style building on the table without taking up the whole table. Um, you can use, you don't have to spend a ton of money on terrain. I mean, you can, there's amazing stuff out there, bridges and buildings and, and who knows, but you can also do things on the cheap. I mean, I started out by making bamboo clumps out of drinking straws and they look great. And a, a buddy of mine made uh, some smaller bamboo out of toothpicks and coffee stir kind of straws. And I made my own um, uh, four-inch area control markers out of, um, they call them craft sticks. They're, they're not really popsicle sticks. They're smaller than that. But basically, it's the same thing. I bought them for $2 for 100 of them at Walmart or something like that. Um, and uh, the, I have a couple of big eight-inch area control markers out of the tournament pack that I, uh, again, went to Walmart, bought some little one-foot squares of cork board for just a couple of bucks, cut eight-inch circles out of them, and then put sand on, glued sand on them, and now I have a couple of islands for my, my kind of tropical water board um, that are, are that way. Um, so there's, and railroad trees, you can, sometimes you can pick up railroad you know, trees that are designed for railroad sets very cheaply and even online. Um, for those of you that have seen my kind of tropical board with all the palm trees and, and things of that nature, cycads, those were dirt cheap. I got them off eBay. They came from China in bulk. Uh, so with a, a relatively small investment in of money and in time, you can make a really fantastic looking board. And uh, we'll do another, I'll do another inset here, uh, looking at some of the terrain pieces that I've got. And um, maybe it'll inspire you to come up with some, some of your own. And um, maybe it'll inspire you to come up with some, some of your own. Last thing I wanna mention is um, scattered terrain. By scatter terrain, I mean little bits and bobs that you just kind of toss around in piles or put here and there, uh, crates and barrels and uh, lanterns, stone lanterns or stone lions, um, piles of little piles of hay or uh, sake barrels. There's there's just uh, the carts. There's there's innumerable things that you can come up with. Um, you can make on your own or you can buy them. There's a lot uh, those of you might have seen my scatter terrain review There's a ton of companies out there that create some really cool bits of scatter terrain. It makes the board look lived in um, Just having the big pieces of terrain on the table are great But it doesn't take a lot of scatter terrain you put a couple of crates out by a pier and some piles of hay by a barn or some bags of, of rice by a barn or a cart with some things piled on it. Uh, you just put a few of these things scattered here and there and they're very minor little terrain pieces. They do give cover, but uh, they really, really add a sense of realism to the table that just having the bigger pieces of terrain on it doesn't. And the reason we go through all this is not only does it make it a lot more fun for us to play on, 
but it makes the table look really special and really spectacular and that is another thing that will draw people to the game and that's the whole point of this video is how, how do we bring people to the game how do we expose them to it the last thing in playing beautifully are the objectives now there's a number of ways in essence Bushido has got two primary types of objectives or well maybe three you've got idols and uh, those are often you either pray at them or you're influencing them you have a couple of larger objectives uh, the 50 millimeter objectives um, those are in the tournament pack and then you have area control objectives either four inches or eight inches i've talked a little bit about how i made my area control objectives um, either out of little sticks of wood or out of uh, just an eight inch diameter circle with sand on it you could put wood on that as well or just make it rocky you could paint it gray and dry brush it and make it look like a kind of a rocky area or a concrete area i've seen uh, some friends that have painted symbols on them um, ash from gorilla miniatures games basically is where i got my idea for my wooden ones he just took a cd and then he put a four inch circle unfortunately cds are a little too big so he took a CD, used it as a base, and then put strips of wood over it to make a smaller four inch diameter circle. So it looks like a little step up. Looks really good. Um, GCT has got very nice idols and 50 millimeter bases, uh, objectives, which are Hakora. I bought my idols from the local game shop. They're just these little, you guys have seen them. They're those little pillars um, that I, painted some kanji on the top, put a little batch of flowers on one side of them so that you could tell which way the idol was facing. Um, there are Grinto available from one of the uh, uh, third party uh, producers of cast material. So you can come up with your own. Um, you know, the, the objectives, there's all kinds of options out there, but, but make them look good. And uh, anything you can do to increase the visual impact of the game is going to increase the chances that you're going to get somebody interested in actually investing in it. Here we are. have the board set up with some terrain on it. As you can see, I have a little farm set up here. So I've got a barn and a little farmhouse. The farmhouse has got a backpack a little stove there's the bamboo that my friend made out of toothpicks and coffee straws you can see the trees are just railroad model railroad trees that i i picked up at a bargain from a, a sale bin at a model railroad store i've got this set up as uh, one of the tournament packs where you have a four inch area of control and two of the large objectives so the radius of control, I'll zoom in a little bit, is just a bunch of sticks laid out. I'll flip that over with a couple of rods underneath that everything are, are glued to. I'm just eyeballing where these things are, by the way. Um, here's the bridge, my homemade bridge. As you can see, it's, it's got a nice arch to it. Again, very simply made. I just drew and then cut those side supports, attached them with three crossbars, and then once again glued a bunch of craft sticks over the top. So I make a nice bridge. Fortunately my water was in a different bin, but normally that would be over water. Um, so when I have a, a, another little barn here, and as you can see I've placed little bits of scatter terrain all around. So. I've got a cart, and I always like putting things on the cart because it makes them look used. I've got some sheaves of grain there of some sort, maybe hay for doing roofs. There's another bigger cart, ox cart, with some various tubs and boxes on it. A little pile of rope by the center. Over there is a well and a little bucket by the well. So, as you can see, with a little bit of effort, you can uh, make a really nice looking table and this is definitely one of those things that 
would attract people to the game. So there we go. The third point <clears throat> I'd like to talk about, I call playing generously. What do I mean by playing generously? Well, if you've got things set up, let's say you found a place to play and you've made a nice board and your friend and, and you are, are playing and you've got your board positioned in the main part of the store, if somebody comes by and asks you a question or it starts, you know, lolling and, 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 you know, talking about how cool the game is, stop your game. Take the time to answer their questions. Um, maybe even invite them to do a demo game once they're done with whatever they're doing and once you're done with your game. You know, uh, we all get involved in our games, especially when they're very competitive. But if somebody comes up and expresses interest in the game, even if it's interrupting what you're doing, stop. Take the time. Look them in the eye. Smile. Talk to them. If it's somebody you know and you know they have a certain interest in either in, in tactics or in the fluff, make sure so you're engaging them in something they're going to understand. Uh, if they're just a random person, then, then just tell them how much fun it is and, and talk about the models and how low the entry cost is and you know, talk about the things that attract you to the game. But take time out. If somebody actually comes up to you and expresses interest, make sure that you reward them with uh, whatever attention they need to uh, get a positive feeling from that experience. Secondly, invite your friends to play. Now this may sound, you know, obvious, but you would be amazed at how impactful a personal invitation can be. Our group here in Madison has been a line of dominoes falling as one person after the other has asked or convinced one of their friends to try it out. And that is how our group has grown so fast, frankly. Uh, my friend Tyler, wanted uh, my son Carl and I to, to play because he wanted to see us paint some of the figures. And then we got involved at Adepticon. And then I was talking to a friend of mine about it, my friend Steve, who you've seen play The Savage Wave. And Steve has gotten a friend of his involved in it. And he's gotten Ben involved. And Ben's gotten Evan involved. And it, this goes on and on and on. And so it is really important that you make those personal connections with friends and try to introduce them to the game. Now, they may not be interested. I actually wasn't interested when Tyler first told me about it, only because I'd been playing 40K for 25 years, and the last thing I needed on the planet was more figures to paint. But he kept after me, and it, he, he basically set me up so that when I got to Adepticon and I saw the Bushido display and they were doing demos that I decided I was going to do the demo and once my son and I did the demo we were hooked. So make those personal invitations and connections. They're very very powerful. Play demo games whenever you can. Uh, as I mentioned earlier you know you might even if you've got two tables maybe set one up to play on and set a second one up just in case anybody's interested in playing a demo. Uh, we found that probably the, the easiest and the most straightforward demo to run are uh, three idols across the center of the table with three figures per side. Usually it's around 24, 25 points, something like that. I mean, it doesn't matter. It's an unofficial game. More models than that, I think it's confusing to run. Less models than that, and if somebody gets a bad dice roll, their guy dies and, and it's all over. So, um, you know, around... Three models, 25 points-ish, um, and if anybody expresses interest, or even if they're just curious, you can say, hey, you know, we're going to be there on Thursday night. Why don't you come on over after your 40K game, and, and I'll run a quick demo, and you can check it out. Um, you don't need to be a retainer to, to do those kinds of games, um, especially because so many places don't have retainers, uh, and it's a, it's a lot to put on a retainer to always be there to do demos. So I think that's everybody's responsibility. Um, so if you get the chance, give it a shot. You know, um, I don't think anybody that we have done a demo for has not gotten involved in the game. Uh, it's a really good game. So if you can get people playing it, that's half the battle. 
The last thing we've done, and I realize this may not be possible for everyone, we have bought starter sets for our friends all over the place down here or up here, depending on where we are in relation to where you are. Uh, I realize that not everybody may be in a position to do that. Luckily in Madison, we have an older gaming group. Most of us are adults with real jobs and, and reasonably disposable income. But if you think about it, the starter sets are, what, 30 pounds? And then the card sets are six pounds and the tokens are six pounds. So that's a total of 42 pounds, which comes out to give or take $55 maybe. That's uh, not a lot of money. I mean, that's what, one box of five space brains nowadays? I, I, I don't know. I mean, that, that's a really small investment. So if you've got a if you've got somebody that you know is interested in the game but they're balking a little bit at well I don't know I'm not sure and I don't want to spend another fifty bucks and da 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 you know if you really think you could get them hooked on the game then you might consider investing a little bit of your own money to get them going uh, obviously once once they get started people get cranked up and then you won't have to worry about that. Anymore. But um, we have had multiple players here not only invite their friends, but, but buy a, a starter set for a friend here or a friend there. And uh, it, it is a really good way to get people going. Maybe give them that little push. If they're not sure and they don't know if they want to spend the money, um, you give them that little nudge by, by uh, getting them a starter set and tokens and, and the basic cards for their faction. And then it's off to the races. All right, so we've reviewed my three principal ideas, which is play publicly, play beautifully, and play generously. The last thing I wanted to cover are what I consider the big selling points. I think most of these are going to appeal to 40K players and War Machine players. Um, that's who we've had the most success in, in attracting. Um, though I, I think these points would attract anybody per se, but you will see as I go through them why they would apply to um, 40K and War Machine players, uh, especially if you've played those games. Uh, you know the kind of struggles and frustrations that we have sometimes with those gaming systems. First of all, I think, is that the low model count sets up a whole bunch of really positive selling points. Number one, getting into the game is very cheap. The rules are free. They're easy to access. There's no rule book at this point. I, I mean, there is an older rule book, but I don't even bring it anymore. The rules are available online. I just bring my smartphone like I would normally do, and if I need to find something, I download the PDF and then I have it right on hand. You don't need to buy a lot of models. Imagine a 50 rice, I mean a starter set is 35 rice, that's the basic entry point for tournaments, and then 50 is the maximum, and 50 is what, 7 to 11 models for most factions? That's one unit of Marines, or you know, and just think about Imperial Guard or Orcs or something like that where you've got these huge units where you're paying the same figure over and over and over and oh, it just, it gets tiring. But here with Bushido, you've got individual figures, you have no duplication or almost no duplication. And they are wonderful sculpts and a handful of models and you are good to go. You could paint up a whole army and make it look good in one weekend, unless you're me in which case it takes two weeks to paint a single model, but that's my problem. Um, this, the, the neat thing about this low model count also, when it comes to painters, if you have somebody like me who is, who takes great pride in the painting and for whom painting is a big part of the hobby, because I only have a few models to paint, I can take a long time painting a model if I want and not feel like I'm never getting anywhere. Because if I paint one or two models in a couple of weeks, I've just increased the size of my army by maybe 20, 25 percent. The the options anyway. But if by on this by the same token, if you have somebody who isn't all that thrilled with painting, they don't have to paint that many models. So 
it kind of benefits both sides. If you're really into painting, you can really focus on the few models you do paint. And if you're not into painting, well, it's okay because you only have to paint seven to nine models and you're you're good to go. At least for starters. You know, as you get into the game, you may decide you want to collect more of the faction. But to get going and, and to be have an army, army that you can be proud of and, and play in tournaments just doesn't take that much effort. And uh, it's easy to transport. And... For some of you, I, I don't know, this may not be a big deal, but I go to Adepticon every year and play in multiple events and transporting armies and terrain and that kind of thing is a real pain in the tuckus. And with Bushido, I've got a plastic bin that's kind of low, it's kind of wide and shallow and I can throw everything in there. I throw my models in there, I throw my terrain in there, I throw my boards in there. Um, I've got a special traveling mat, which is just a piece of railroad grass mat, basically, that just rolls up, and I just roll it up and throw it in there, and, and it's with everything else. So the small table size, the small model count, everything lends itself towards being cheap and easy and convenient, and those are tremendous factors when it comes to selling the game. The other thing I focus on is that it's got an excellent rule set. Um, it, the rules are free online. The, uh, the tactics are, are very dominant in this game. Um, most everybody in our group has either tied or won a game after being tabled. And uh, that just doesn't happen with other games. So there's a lot of really interesting synergies. Um, you know, it's not just a slaughter everything and I win by default kind of a game. I think we're, you know, those are are fun, but it gets tiring after a while and it's not very mentally uh, taxing or challenging. Bushido's definitely challenging. And uh, I, a lot of people find that as one of its strongest points. Plus, we have a, a past master that is now primarily in charge of keeping the game balanced and changing the rules and, and getting things squared away. And we're about to get a brand new rule set. Uh, again, it's a very good time to be promoting Bushido. Um, so lastly, uh, the games can go very quickly. Now I know there's been a lot of talk with just about every competitive game when you get in tournaments that people run out of time. And that's because we're all trying to be very careful and do every perfect move. But I know that, that my son, Carl, and I, when we sit down and focus and we play armies where we're familiar with the figures and we know what they do, we know what the rules are, we can go through a, we can go through a, a full 50 rice game in an hour or less. And that is really cool. When you go, you know, I think the last time I played 40K on a 40K night, we got through three turns and we took all night. Um, most of the time when we play Bushido, everybody's getting two games in at night at least, and some are getting in three. So the fact that, that it's very tactically challenging, very beautiful, and very fast, um, once you get the handle on your rules, you know, it's of course, while you're learning, it's, it's going to be much slower. But once you get going, you can really crank through the games, and that uh, that's a lot of fun, because that means I don't just play one of my friends in an evening, I play two or three, which for me is a big bonus. So... Well, I think that's it. Um, we've covered most of what I wanted to talk to you about. We've taken a look at my boards and some of my terrain. Uh, I strongly hope that some of this advice will be useful to you. If you think you've got other ideas, I would love to hear them. Please post it in the comments down below. If you try some of these and they work or don't work for you, I'd like to hear that as well. Um, this is definitely something that I'm putting forward for everybody in the community in hopes of getting some discussion going and, and helping us all to, to build our groups and have more people to play and have more fun. So that's it. Thank you everyone for watching and thank you for joining me on Gitsapalooza. We'll see you next time.